Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to the Thursday morning study, the last study this week of uh, understanding the lines. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> a dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here as we study together. We need your um, your help in understanding these things that we are looking at. We also need help in our personal lives. Uh, we lift up Heidi in prayer and Dwight as well with the issues with their eyes. And um, we just pray for wisdom and your guidance in all these things. And uh, we pray for... Uh, the friends and family of those that are grieving for the loss of our friend Jeanette. And um, we know, Lord, other people have losses in their lives, things that they mourn. And we ask, Lord, that you can help us uh, to understand uh, that you are in control of all these things, and that there's purposes that uh, we may not understand today, but we will understand. And we are with you in your kingdom. Be with us now as we open your word together. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> good morning again, everyone. And uh, uh, as we're, we're looking at uh, the story of Gideon, we have... So just to sort of do a quick review, we have three chapters in Judges that addresses Gideon. And we had already drawn out these lines, but had not, um, and, and placed the dates on our line. And some of them we, we marked the events or the symbols in the story of Gideon uh, on those lines, but we had not created them as lines with, you know, period of darkness particularly and uh, marking the arrival of the first message, etc. Um, so we're going to look at that. And yesterday we went over um, just understanding how these lines are interacting with each other. So we know, um, so I'm going to go here. And we did read chapter six, and we're going to finish that off. Um, <clears throat> So the idea here is that we have uh, these lines of Gideon. Um, so chapter six, seven, and eight, roughly, though some of the verses overlap from the various chapters. And we could put these on a line. Um, and, and in some ways, we did sort of consider uh, that in placing these dates on a line. But you can see that this first line has, well, eight way marks, though we have this doubling here of fleece one and fleece two. And, and so we're gonna have to address it, you know, what these way marks are. I think it's fairly straightforward. And, and then we see that with Judges seven and uh, Judges seven starting with Judges six and then Judges eight starting with uh, a verse in Judges seven. Now, these lines, so um, let me see here. When we look at, at this line here, so this is the line of, I want to do this first. So this is the judge's line. So just make sure that, that, that we're all understanding this. So this judge's line is um, a zoom into a way mark on another line. And so we're saying that this is a zoom into 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel's message. So this directly relates to our history, the history of this movement. And um, when we look at... Uh, uh, well, we can see this here, the judge's line here as well. And when we first went through... Othnia, Ehud, and Shamgar, so that's what I want to find here. We could see that, that they were a zoom into the first way mark, that is, the arrival of the, of the first angel's message, 
which is 9-11, but that um, uh, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar each had their own line. So the Othniel line, we didn't really draw the separate line for Othniel because um, that tends to be a much more general line. It doesn't have as much detail, at least that I could find. Um, but when we looked at Ehud, uh, this one specifically addressed the 2520 in this movement, especially with the arrival of the first part of that message and then its development in connection with time. And then Shamgar uh, specifically addressed um, events really in my personal line to, to a large degree, uh, but, but addressing this, the idea of time setting, um, which it's going to lead to October 13th. So not doing a very good job of explaining this, but what we can see is that we can zoom into a waymark like 9-11, and we can see that there is Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar that are a line in and of themselves, all those three together, but each has their own line. And so we, we noticed this when we went through the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was very clear that we could do this. Uh, I mean, it wasn't just clear that we could do it. It was clear that that's what is happening. When we look at each of these individuals, each of these waymarks, in that case, it's addressing the covenants. Um, and, and we saw that in the story of Joseph as well. So now in the book of Judges, we've been able to, uh, to separate these lines out much more clearly than we have in the past. And also because we can directly relate them to events in our history, uh, we can then clearly see that these lines are not uh, something that we create through a subjective means. Uh, there's something that is there for us to examine. So, um, right. I like you saying it like that, as opposed to, you know, we could do this or we could do that. It's actually what we're seeing what's actually going on with the scriptures as opposed yeah. to us making stuff up. <laughs> we, we're using a magnifying glass, so to speak, on these events. And we, we, we just see in them the events and the dates and the waymarks of our line, which we have already established. Right. So. All that yeah. stuff is there. We just never noticed it before. Yeah. You know, and I, I've dealt with lots of other... Um, people who study the Bible in similar ways that we do, that is, they will make connections between verses. Um, you know, for instance, this guy, uh, Daniel Kim from Korea, who's a Wednesday crucifixion guy. And I, I've been talking to him for like nine years on uh, Facebook messenger. And he, you know, he will do things and notice, you know, for instance, the waters of Shiloh. And then he will go to Nehemiah where it talks about, uh, you know, so he looks at these verses where it's talking about, because uh, that's Shiloh, that's the, uh, the pool sent, Siloam, right? And then he'll look at this in Nehemiah, uh, that they repair this gate and, and the, the plumbing and all this different stuff dealing with these pools. But then he, he connects these. But he doesn't really have a framework in which to interpret what he's seeing because everything to him is about Wednesday crucifixion. And so, you know, he'll say, I'm choosing, I'm not choosing the waters of Shiloh, I'm choosing uh, the waters of Assyria. But I, I ask him based on what, you know, what is the objective measure that you can show me that anything that you're doing makes any sense. And of course, he can't. Now, to be fair, he has Asperger's and he doesn't think very clearly. But because of his Asperger's, he's noticed his details that other people don't notice. Um, like he noticed the 2300 months is um, uh, 
186 years, for instance. Right. So, so he notices these things, but he doesn't know how to apply them. And what we have done is we've, we've been given this information without understanding these details. And now as time has gone on, we've been able to recognize these details and they're, they're an objective measure because it's mathematics, it's chronology, it's, it's things that you can, you can clearly see and measure. There still is a subjective element to it, right? That is, we still need obviously the discernment of the Holy Spirit and we need the work of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. But we can see that the work that is being done by this movement at the present time agrees with the established understanding of truth that has been given since the time of Miller. Well, you can go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, but as far as these lines are concerned in our history, this is something that has been given to us and all we are doing is examining it. So we, we examine these things and we can see them. Now, so getting to the line of Gideon, we had addressed that there is this connection between November 9th and September 11th. Now, in, um, in the story uh, of Gideon, we know that they're under the oppression of Midian and the Amalekites and the children of the East. So there's a, a threefold enemy. And we know that there's a prophet who has given a message that they're going to be delivered. And they've been in um, being oppressed for seven years. Now, September 11th and November 9th have this connection to each other. So even though we have these symbols here, uh, when the angel of the Lord comes and visits Gideon, which would be a September, September 11th symbol, we're attaching it to November 9th. So we've been zooming into this history of September 11th. And the line of Gideon is also a zoom into November 9th. That is 9-11 and 11-9 are tied together. And they've been in oppression for how long? How long is the Midianite oppression? Seven years. So it's seven years. So that, that's a symbol of the seven times. Now, it is interesting, uh, just dealing with this November 9th date. So when, Stephen, when you and I were there at the School of the Prophets in Adilio uh, on November 9th, what was Jeff saying in his presentations? Um, and I think this was more on, must have been his presentations on November 9th, because I think that's the only presentations I saw. What was he saying about uh, this period that the door was to be uh, open still? So he said November 9th marked his closed door, but he was giving more time. And how much time was he giving? Do you remember? It's not coming to mind. Well, he was giving a week. So he was going to attach a week to it. And if we counted inclusively from November 9th a week, that would end on November 15th, right? So we need to go back and look at those presentations on November 9th and see what he says about it. Um, and I can't remember all of the reasonings regarding that. I just mostly remember that he was attaching this week that we had. I can't remember what, what story it was from, but he was attaching. Think, um, from Ezekiel, you have the 30th ah. year we mentioned, and then you have Tel Aviv, ah, where right. Ezekiel is sitting before the elders for a week. Yeah, even though that happens only in vision, we still use that week as that symbol. Okay, so that's actually an important point. Now, if we go a week 
starting November 9th is the first day. The seventh day would be which date? Fifteenth. Yeah, the fifteenth. So November fifteenth is an interesting date. Um, when we go to the Mayan calendar and we look at that date, it's the date thirteen zero seven zero zero. So that seven represents seven uh, periods of three hundred and sixty days. So seven periods of three hundred and sixty days is how many days? 2,520. Yeah, so it's 2520. Right. And now, of course, that's because the mind calendar switches, you know, from 12 to 13 on December 21st, 2012. And so that's why we have that, that date, November 15th is the seven times for that mind calendar in that 13th back tune. Now, um, Heidi and I met on that date. And so on November 15th, the morning of November 15th, I, I wished Heidi a happy 2520. Um, so, uh, so I noticed that, of course, that 2520 days. But if we think about this oppression as being seven years, uh, we could definitely place it there on November 9th to 15th, that is, it's connected. So it's it's seven years. November 9th would be seven years less eight, seven days, roughly, inclusively. So it's just a little detail, uh, be connecting that to the 2520, to the seven years. Now, we know that then there's this offering that's uh, prepared. Now, this prepare, preparation of the offering, we're, we're going to bring this line uh, um as this period of time that the offering is prepared. But then we have Judges 6, 21, and 22. And so what did we do with Judges 6, 21, and 22? This would be accepting the offering, right? So the offering is going to be prepared. And then, um, and in 22, uh, Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And so if we're going to mark these events, uh, what we didn't do here is we need to put November 9th as the arrival of the first angel. So I'm just going to do it down here. And then we would have an increase of light. So do we have an increase of light that um, is then going to lead to uh, what happens on June 21st and 22nd? And how do we relate these two together? So I'm just boring this here. So this is the formalization of the message. So what is this date and how can we connect this as a formalization? And then we have to figure out really what the period of darkness is, what is actually being marked on November 9th and how the formalization there. So we, we've talked about that November 9th in the previous line dealing with Barak and Deborah had to do with the two presentations on the 273. But that's not the only thing that November 9th is addressing. So what happens on June 21st and 22nd? So we're saying that's Judges 6, 21, 22. That's the... Uh... The advertisement. Okay, so the publication in the Tennessean, well, it's uh, it's the ad is published. And on June 21st, so there, there was another ad um, uh, on like previous to that, which I don't know which day of the week that was. 
was. Was that Wednesday? Wednesday. But it wasn't really noticed. Nobody made any comments about it. It was just an ad. I don't know what that ad looked like, whether it was the same ad. Uh, but the one on the side was a full page ad. I think you know the, one, the one on the, it was the 17th of June. And uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't as controversial. It was just more inviting people to, like, to look at the, the website, to study some okay. insight to Bible prophecy, rather than stating that there's going to be an Islamic attack. There's okay. nothing we got there. Okay. So, so here is where we actually present. It's formalized. The message is formalized. And, um, and then there is, of course, the response. So for the first time, this movement gets uh, any kind of attention, really, even from the church, because the church never uh, ever paid attention to FFA. Even all that time during the 2520, I mean, local churches and conferences had, had to deal with the issue. But um, from people that I've talked to who have connections, they say the general conference knew nothing about the 2520. It just wasn't of interest to them. But of course, with this publication uh, in the Tennessee and with this ad, uh, we definitely did draw the attention of the the general conference plus international attention so it became international news not not the biggest news story or anything but still it was a story it, it might and, not have been that big but it it went everywhere yeah yeah so it went everywhere and uh and of course people in nashville um made fun of it especially on july 18th so that means that it was in people's minds mm -hmm. for a while. And when there was that uh, mushroom cloud, which was a, a, a thunderhead, a cumulonimbus cloud uh, that appeared to be over Nashville, uh, they made fun of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so it did get into the public consciousness on some level. And, and that's going to be on the 22nd. So we know that. Uh, the 22nd is the symbol for FFA, and we have June 22nd in 2011, June 22nd in 2014. Uh, the center date of that is December 21st, 2012, between those two dates. And then we have, uh, starting with the Mayan calendar, ending with December 21st, 2021, uh, the center is the end of June 22nd. 2017 is the center of that chiasm. And then we have three years later again, so these are all three year spans, going to June 22nd, 2020. And we're also going to, um, uh, you know, there's lots of other lines and connections that use that date. Um, and we just don't usually, uh, we haven't addressed them in, in a particular line. So that you can actually zoom into some of these waymarks and create other lines. But, but anyway, we have this June 22nd, 21st, 22nd date, and we're connecting that to Judges 21, 22. So this is the formalization of the message. This offering has been prepared, and now it's been accepted, right? And uh, so that's going to be the formalization. And that makes the most sense. Uh, you know, if you're going to look at a formalized formal, form formalization such as you know the publishing of the time of the end magazine this would be equivalent with that or uh, miller getting his credentials in 1833 so then we have um judges 627 and so we this is obviously going to be uh, the empowerment of this message now this one's a little trickier because not everybody's completely familiar with this but june 27 um what's the significance of june 27 and why is it the empowerment of the first message and how do we connect this to the verse so the verse that we have is um gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the lord had said unto him 
And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could do it, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. So um, we have some symbols there in Judges 6.27. And this, of course, has to do with this building of this altar. So how does this relate in any way to June 27th? Does anybody know? Anybody remember what June 27th is about? Is there any relationship between 622 and 627 first? Well, um, Samuel Snow's third letter was mm. wrote on June 22nd and then published June 27th. Yep. Okay. And we also have uh, 622 and 627 in Ezekiel, right? That is, we're going to have uh, the prophecy of the 390. And the 40, the 40 is going to begin in 627 BC, right? The 40 years. And he starts that prophecy in the 30th year, right? And that's going to go back to um, Josiah's Passover in 622, right? Mm -hmm. right? So 622 and 627 are tied together. There's more connections between them. Adilio did some work on that as well. So, so we can see that they're tied together as part of this message. So a formalization, but then an empowerment. Now, June 22nd, nothing happens on June 22nd. But June 22nd is connected um, with uh, the presentation from January uh, 14th, 2017. So what is that? Uh, presentation. So how many days is it? So what happens on January 14th, 2017? That's when uh, Jeff presents um, Panem. Yeah, right. And the pandemic prediction is, as Iran pointed out. So if you go to um, that date and you count 1260 days, it brings you to June 27th. But it also, if you go 273 days from June 27th, you come to March 27th. 2021. So you're going to have this um, uh, this date that is in 2020, that it's going to be 21 days prior to uh, July 18th. So it's this three weeks of Daniel chapter 10. And, and why would that be important? Why would why would we connect this three weeks before? July 18th, what would this have to do with Jan Daniel chapter 10? Because Daniel chapter 10, he's going to, to fast for three full weeks. He's going to be in mourning three full weeks. So how did we connect uh, this to July 18th? So that's going to be the next way mark. So we're going to see that there is three weeks there. Put this in the wrong spot. Hang on. So you're going to have these 21 days, three full weeks. That's going to be Daniel chapter 10. 
that's going to be the vision of of where he sees Christ and he's told about what happened in 539 and what's been happening right there over the last three weeks since he began his fasting this battle going on over the mind of Cyrus regarding releasing the captives so how does this relate why would we address these three full weeks 21 days so we got we got a 1260 that's going to be going from this other date which we don't have on this line but there's 1260 and then we have 273 to march 27th 2021 which we don't have on this line because this line's not particularly addressing that and we remember that 1260 plus 273 is 1533 so that's the wonderful manifestation of the power of God. So what about these three weeks? Because I had noted this before June 21st or June 27th, uh, about these three weeks before July 18th, about the pandemic which occurs between November 9th and July 18th. So how have, how have we looked at the significance of these three weeks? Does anybody know how Jeff addressed the three weeks in Daniel chapter 10? I'm sorry, bro. I, I don't have access to my all my notes. I I don't have my laptop uh, from work anymore, which had all my office products on it. I have to buy some new office products. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So just the significance of Daniel chapter 10. So this is, of course, connected to Daniel chapter 11 and 12. And he's going to have this, this vision, and he's going to be touched three times. Mm. Right? Oh, yeah. Now I'm, I'm beginning to remember. Okay. Often takes the right triggers. Yeah. Okay, so he's going to, so the three touches, so what are the three touches? What, how was Jeff understanding them? It had been uh, connected to the Mara vision. Okay, to the Mara vision, wherever we say it. Okay, and that, that would be the vision of the looking glass. Right? Yeah, so I think it's uh, Mara. No, it's Mara. Theodore's right. Yeah, Mara, but... Anyway, the Mar Ab vision, if we're going to use the right vowel. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It's the looking glass vision, right? That's, that's how Jeff was attaching that. So, um, so why the three touches? Was he marking those as three way marks? I believe so. Right now, he also did connect them with Islam, right? So the first, second, and third woe, if I remember correctly. That these, but 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 that's more an expanded version of it. That he could bring those things into our lines. So we we would also attach them to um, what would happen in our line with Islam, 
correct? Yes. So we were looking at July 18th as an attack on the United States by Islam. And of course, that never happened. Um, but we understand that this line is typical. The symbols that are here in this line uh, are actually addressing events in this, this movement. So we can see that July 18th is the arrival of the second angel's message. Now, we have the empowerment of the first angel on June 27th, and we have these three weeks, so three sevens. And of course, that would be significant in the structure of the seven seven sevens to begin with. And so we, we've played around with trying to understand these three, what these three touches are. I mean, we could look at them as November 9th, 2019, July 18, 2020, and December 25th, 2021, right? So we could look at those, those three Sabbaths. So in a sense, the 21 days is a symbol of those three dates, but this was supposed to be a period of fasting. And I, I don't think necessarily literally fasting that that was what is symbolized here. But there was to be a work that was that should have occurred in this period of time regarding un, regarding the understanding of July 18th, especially in connection uh, with the light that had come from the Mayan calendar. Um, we should have been doing a deeper study uh, than we were. And I, I was sort of disappointed isn't the right word. I was just um, wondering why we weren't doing what we should have been doing if we were going to take that 1260 to June 27th, 2020 from the Panium prediction. Um, that 21 days to July 18th more seriously. So we, we should have been saying, this is not, you know, something to be taken lightly. Um, but it, but it, in a sense was, that is, nobody was really caring about these 21 days or what, what it would mean. And, and to me, the fasting there of Daniel would be representing a study that needed to be done. That, that wasn't happening. There's just things we weren't wanting to look at. And, and I could see in that period of time that what was happening, the messages that were coming from FFA weren't really the right messages. But, you know, I, I couldn't really do anything about it. It, it started to just... Uh, um, ramp up emotionally, but the understanding wasn't there. People weren't really understanding July 18th, and especially to understand that it could not happen as, as we were expecting. So, so we're going to have this first disappointment, right? That's going to be the arrival of the second angel, it parallels April 19th, 1844. And now we use, use Judges 6, verse 34 for this. And Judges 6, 34. Um, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. So why do we use that verse for July 18th? Why is this trumpet that's being blown why is this on July 18th? As I believe we've established, trumpets are normally used to give a word of warning or to gather people together for a convocation. Okay. So in this case, is this not a word of warning? Yes. So so those would apply. The other thing that we know is that it's the message of the seven trumpets, which 
in the message of the seven trumpets is the message of the the three woes, right? Correct. So, and so Correct. July fifteenth is a result, partly it's Ezekiel and Revelation nine. So it's going to be this um, the sixth and or the fifth and sixth trumpet that give us this structure dealing with Islam. And so the blowing of the trumpet symbolizes the trumpets on July 18th. So this is a date that we got from Josiah Lich's prophecy. Right. So that's the 26th day of the fourth month, July 18th. Now, um, now a person could argue the disappointment is the next day, July 19th, but you know, July 18th is this message. This second message arrives. Now, on July 17th, but technically July 18th, you know, it's going to, I'm going to go through the study that evening. So it's going to reach into uh, the time where, you know, we end after Sabbath starts, where I'm at, or, and especially where Nashville was. Um, that I'm going to present the mind calendar study showing that we should consider that this prediction may, may fail. Now, I already believed that it had failed to some degree once the sun had set, because I believed that it would happen at sunset. But I'd started the study already, and I already had published on April 26th of 2020 that there was a likelihood the prediction would fail because it's on a line of failed predictions. Now, one of the criticisms regarding July 18 is that we didn't have that in its parallel with October 22, 1844, is that we didn't have a Hiram Edson with a vision telling us the reason for our disappointment. But we did, right? So this is because we know that Hiram Edson's uh, vision in the cornfield wasn't common knowledge in Adventism till 1905, I believe. It's, it, anyway, when Loughborough put, uh, put out his book and uh, mentioned his, his, uh, his own recollections of Hiram Edson's recollections, recollections of what happened. Though it was written in uh, 1868, Hiram Edson had written it down, and we do have part of that manuscript. Uh, that still has survived. But a few friends knew about his vision, but it wasn't it wasn't the vision of Hiram Edson that settled um, what had happened. It wasn't well known within Adventism. It wasn't uh, it wasn't the reason that we now knew that Christ had moved from the holy to the most holy place and we were in the day. He was a year later. Um, before we knew anything about that. I mean, the, the, the movement knew anything about that, wasn't it? About, about a year about, later. About higher Yeah, no. when he had the vision in the cornfield, it was like a year or so later. No, it wasn't a year. So they, the movement didn't know about it. That's what I'm trying to say, is it wasn't known until 1905, except a few people. Well, that's 50-plus years down the trail. Right. So, so Adventism did not know about it. I mean, James and Ellen White knew about it. Um, Crozier knew about it because he was the one walking with Hiram Edson. And Crozier did do his studies uh, based upon this idea that Christ had begun his ministry in the most holy place. So indirectly, uh, there is a study that comes from that vision. But it's not understood. It's not like he had the vision and the whole movie heard about it, and then now they, they had this witness. But that was the criticism about July 18th. But I was clear on July 19th when I did my presentation on, on Sunday, the next day, that this was light that had been given to us to understand um, the failure of the prediction. So just like Hiram Edson had this vision, so to speak, we had the same thing. This movement had 
this understanding that had put, been put in place. And, and the understanding put in place for Hiram Edson would have been, of course, the understanding of the typology that was being used for October 22, 1844. They were looking for the 10th day of the seventh month, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, in my paper on uh, the wave sheaf offering, for those who have who've read it, uh, the wave offering, the timing of the wave offering in Leviticus 23, it, near the end of that paper, I address the fact that if you were to calculate the 10th day of the seventh month in 1844, um, you would have to use Boston to get October 22. If you use Jerusalem, you get October 23 as the 10th day of the seventh month. And, and I make an argument in there, which, which is something I believe for a long time, is that God never intended Jerusalem to be uh, um, the way that we always calculate uh, the festivals. Now, of course, when people were in Israel, Jerusalem is where you would uh, calculate, you know, the month or the time, the year to have your festivals. But you can't have that unless you have the technology that we have today, where people can know what's happening in Jerusalem. So uh, did we decide that it was uh, more of a local? Well, because that's the way the Millerites did now, now, some people argue with that, um, that it was, but they were looking at what was happening locally to determine um, when the 10th day of the seventh month was. Because they didn't know at first which day. They had the 23rd and they, and they had the 22nd. Now, it's rather complicated how they, they came to the 22nd because they should have come to the 23rd if based on the system that they were using, because they believed that you observe the month, every month you observe the new moon. And if you observe the new moon, um, and, and also even how they ended up with April 19th. I mean, it's, it's a close call if you're going to start the first day of the first month. If you're going to see the visible crescent um, on the evening of the 18th in Jerusalem, it's a pretty close call. Um, because it, it could possibly be visible, but it's not guaranteed to be. Uh, so, so we ended up with April 19th as the first day of the first month out of God's providence. Now, if you use Boston, it definitely would be visible. So, so you would have to use Boston if you're going to get April 19th as the first day of the first month. Um, particularly if you use the arguments, so this is rather de detailed, but uh, Grace Amidon, so when we get Jesus crucified on a Friday in 31 AD, uh, Grace Amidon uh, makes the argument that the Passover has to be after the day of the full moon and that you couldn't have the Passover on the Thursday, even though that technically would uh, be possible by, by observation, um, because you have to have um, the Passover after the full moon. And, and so that has to be the Friday. And um, but if you applied that to 1844, that would make April 20th the first day of the first month. So Grace Amidon applies it to 31 AD, but she doesn't apply it to 1844. So that's inconsistent. So um, just for the benefit of anybody else listening, Grace was that Seventh-day Adventist um, uh, person that wrote about this? Yeah, in the, in the 1940s. Right. Yeah, she's the one that the lunar Sabbatarians misused some of her uh, statements uh, to support the idea that the Adventist church suppressed the... Uh, suppressed the lunar sabbath that grace amadin had shown that uh the week was based upon the month and the, the church suppressed this and it's totally ridiculous but um that's what uh, lunar sabbatarians believe that grace amadin supported a lunar sabbath which 
she doesn't. I mean, you read everything she wrote, there's nothing there about a lunar Sabbath. Um, so, so anyway, uh, going back to Hiram Edson. So when he sees Christ moving from the holy to the most holy, if he, if you were in Jerusalem, that would be the 10th day of the seventh month, the 23rd. And this would be the afternoon, which where the high priest would then move from the holy to the most holy. So based on Jerusalem time, Hiram Edson was seeing in real time the event as it happened in heaven. Does that make sense? Yes. That's on the 23rd. Now, the church never addresses this problem. Um, other people have noticed it. You know, because if Christ moved from the holy to the most holy, why is he doing that on the 23rd and not on the 22nd, if that's the 10th day of the seventh month? But in God's providence, it is the 10th day of the seventh month, October 22, where the, where the Millerites are. Which right. is why we uh, came to the conclusion that uh, it was based on locality as opposed to uh, Jerusalem time. It yes. Those that make the discovery, basically. Yeah, and I do that also with Hiram Edson's uh, 26th day of the fourth month in uh, 1809. So in 1809, we have these different, you know, the hour, day, month, year, right? So 30... Uh, 30 years is, is going to be that month that goes from the 26th day of the fourth month in 1809 to the 26th day of the fourth month in 1839. And then you're going to have the day that brings you to the 26th day of the fourth month in 1840. And then from there, you count 15 days, right? I know that's rather complicated, but if I was to, to use Jerusalem in 1809, I wouldn't get, I would be a day off with that 26th day of the fourth month. It wouldn't line up with July 27th as all the other ones do. Um, and in this case, July 27th, Julian. But if I use Boston, it does. And so I make that argument uh, that, that in America, you're going to use uh, Boston in Millerite history because that's really what they're doing even if they're not aware of it so that they have a local calendar that, that applies then to that history, to that time. Now we don't continue to do that at this time. We use the Jerusalem one and 99% of the time they're going to be the same. There's only the odd time that they don't line up. But anyway, so this is sort of a long explanation. When we get to this arrival of the second angel, in, in this history, we are lining it up with October 22, right? So we're, we're, we took this July 18th disappointment, which really in this line represents the first disappointment, but it also represents the great disappointment because of the light that's coming here with, in connection with July 18th. So, so we can line it up with there. So what is it then about this? Why are we bringing up Hiram Edson and this whole criticism? Uh, what is it that then in this history from July 18th to January 11th to 12th, 2023, what is, what is this message? What is this second angel's message? So we still haven't really addressed all of this line as far as the darkness and these different groups that are being tested and so forth. But <clears throat> so what is the second angel's message that arrives on July 18th? That's analogous with Hiram Edson's vision the next day.
Well, that was the uh, higher mentions thing was a it was a big turning point to their understanding, but it wasn't necessarily uh, understood throughout the entire movement. Right. So, so I understand this, but I don't think the movement has ever addressed um, what this July 18 disappointment means. One is we tend to deny it. Right. You know, so just like the, you know, the Adventist church doesn't really, I mean, they give lip service to October 22, 1844. They don't really understand it. Right. It's something you have to agree with to be in this movement. You have to agree with July 18. But the understanding of what these lines mean and what July 18 meant isn't understood by this movement. Now, I think I understand it. So well, if we were to look at it happening. in a logical manner, we're sitting there making this prediction based on what our understanding of the lines were. And our understanding of the lines was, to back a, uh, to, for lack of a better word, was flawed. Right. So we don't understand the lines. These very that, things that we've been studying right from what the beginning. was the very first thing that we start we moved to, or second thing that we moved to uh, after we studied Ezekiel, I believe, it was we moved to well, the. Well, we examine the found lines. we examine the foundation. That's right. And then we move to understanding the lines. But in examining the foundation, we were <laughs> trying to understand the lines, just not addressing them directly. Because we were looking back, was the foundation laid correctly? And we came to the conclusion it was. That it was. Both in Millerite history and in our history. So, so the movement, for the most part, when I look at the studies, you know, and I look at, and I'm not criticizing you know, like Daniel Font, you know, in any way. But what he's presenting is he's presenting very basic Adventism. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's solid stuff. But he's not examining the lines. He's not looking, he's not trying to see what light God has been giving us. And so there's nothing wrong with going back and saying, you know, here's what we believe. You know, we got a Sunday law coming. All these things are very solid. But we've been through an experience and we need to understand it. Amen. So we have we have two different approaches. So we have Daniel Fontenot's approach, which is just to to reiterate what we already know, that every Seventh-day Adventist should know, every conservative Adventist would know, for the most part. There's not really a lot there, because he's dealing with the papacy and the Sunday law and, and so forth. Those are all things that we all would believe. And then we have the approach that is, well, the predictions didn't really fail. Right? That would be Odilio and Colin. And, and particularly Colin much more with Trump and Adilio much more with July 18. If we want to simplify it that way, right? Correct. And then we have what we've been doing in our studies, which is definitely a lot more detailed, but recognizing that these related to our lines and that we can't, say that we're in this bigger line. We need to know what line we're in. Trump came in a line that addressed this movement. And if you try to take Trump and say, well, he's the one who brings in the Sunday law. I mean, possibly Trump could be dead by then. Right. I'm not trying to predict his death, but I'm just saying that, you know, he's going to die one day sooner than later and um we have a lot of things that have to be done before we get to the sunday law that this movement was raised up to do and we're not going to get off um that easy when it comes to the responsibilities that that have been given to us and and the first responsibility we have because if we're looking at our lines and, and we're looking at Christ's crucifixion as the disappointment. 
Well, that actually relates to the second angel's message, right? And and right. so so this movement, it, and and we haven't examined the lines of Christ yet, because there's tons and tons of lines in in the Gospels. But what we know is that there's there's a lot to do. The disciples had to go to the upper room. And, and unless this movement can do that, it can't take up the responsibilities that have been given to it. It can't complete the work. So however that's going to happen, God is going to take care of it. But we also have a responsibility individually to um, examine our own hearts and be converted and recognize the things that we've done that are wrong and apologize to those that we've hurt. I think that right there is uh, our highest priority. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and with the camp meeting, I mean, I just want to create an opportunity where people can actually see each other in person. Right. It's not even so much, you know, what's going to be said as far as the meetings are concerned. Uh, we need to get together and see each other in person, especially those that are at odds with each other. Because separation allows for the imagination to take over. So we can imagine people have attitudes and feelings and views and perceptions because we have a distorted attitudes and, and perceptions, right? To say the least. And so, so, I mean, if we have those, we know that other people have them. And, I mean, the Holy Spirit obviously has to do a work upon our hearts in order for us to see those things. But just being together to have to deal with a person that you have certain feelings about um, is important. I mean, it, the disciples couldn't have have gone through the work that, that they did if they weren't physically together in the upper room. It would have been much more difficult if they were doing it on Zoom. And, you know, definitely if they were uh, doing it through uh, messages communicated by others, right? Because um, those messages would get distorted. Seeing somebody face to face is, I think, pretty important in that regard. And that's one of the things that I really have a hard time with the Canadian and the American group. And I know we do it here in the morning studies as well. I don't see anybody's faces. And that bothers me. Right. Uh, I, well, to be honest with you, it's for me, uh, it's a distraction uh, for you, it seems as though. Because I see you looking up at the screens um, for that for that look, you know. But I don't. I don't put my my stuff out there uh, to be a distraction. I just, you know, we have my name up there, basically. Yeah, I know, but uh, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, I think on Sabbath people should see each other. I mean, especially if we're taking it as a church service. You know, I will remember this. But but I've tried it, you know, and 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 it and it's. I mean, I know sometimes I'm the only person there that they can see my face. And so, you know, I end up, you know, turning off my, my camera uh, because I just don't feel comfortable when I can't see anybody else's face and they can see mine, right? You know, and I'm not the one speaking, right? So, so I really think that somehow we have to figure this out um, of, of, of how we think about others. And what can happen to us when we're in contact with others? Because it's not so much about the other person. It's about us, right? I mean, it's about when I get together with other people in person, am I going to have the same feelings? Am I going to have the same attitudes about them that I, that I can have if, I, if they're just sort of distant? You know, it's like when you have... Uh, you know, you're driving in your car and, you know, somebody cuts you off and, 
you know, if you saw that person like just walking face to face and you, you know, you're walking down the street, you wouldn't have the same reactions and emotions. Uh, you know, if you bumped into each other, you'd be sorry and, and all that because it's a real person, but a car is kind of an object. Even though there's a person there, we, we distance ourselves from that person. So, so, so I think that happens. With, All civility goes out the window, so to speak. Yeah. And, and the same, you know, social media, people can say a lot of things on social media that you would never say to that person's face. Right. Because it's sort of impersonal. So, and same with zoom, especially if you can't see the person and like, I don't think that the, the conflicts that we had, um, you know, on Zoom, uh, with the, where I was involved, we wouldn't have had those conflicts if we were in person. I guarantee you. People wouldn't have reacted the way that they did. People wouldn't have said the things they did if we were in person. One is we would see the people's uh, expressions and read them differently. Uh, because often we can read into a, a voice because we don't have all the visual clues uh, when we're talking to somebody about what somebody's attitude is. Um, but also it's just we wouldn't say those things to a person's face that we can say on Zoom. Right. So it would be a whole completely not, different. I'm not so thing. sure about that, Theodore. <laughs> well, I am. I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure about it. Because I know how how I am because I deal with people all the time and I can easily um, when somebody's upset with me in person, I can e easily resolve that situation. Diffuse the situation. Yes. It's easy to do it while on, you're right there. Yeah. It's much easier to do in person than it is, especially on zoom when you have the delay and all that kind of stuff going on, you know, people feel that you're cutting them off. Um, from their perspective, but you're not cutting them off from your perspective because they finished talking and then you started talking, right? Um, so there's a lot of things there, but I, I deal with people all the time and I can easily calm people down. I can even do it on the phone, but it's much easier in person. Um, so when there's conflicts, I've dealt with lots of conflicts with people and, and I just don't have, I've had very few situations where uh, those conflicts were quickly resolved in person. Um, you know, I can think of one or two in in my life. So I'm about the same way. I, I could think of one or two times it didn't work that way, but most of the time it works that way. Because I can see the person's reaction. What is I can see the person's upset, you know, so it doesn't even escalate. <laughs> You know, unless the person pretends that they're not upset and they're good at pretending they're not upset and they're being subversive. But anyway, that's a whole other story. I, I just think that what, what has to happen in this movement is this, this understanding of the lines, but it's not just about the understanding of the lines. It's about our experience in these lines, what these mean. And so we've been moving towards... Uh, the upper room in our studies of the lines. That's what the lines have been illustrating for us. Right? Especially when we deal with the lines of Samson. <clears throat> but even here in the lines of, of Gideon, we see that as well. Though it's Samson becomes even closer to home. Um, and then we have the fleece. So the fleece we put as March 7th, 2021 and December 26, 2021. So these are particularly, everybody remember what these are, what these dates represent? Which dates are we talking about? March 7th, 2021 and December 26, 2021. This is going to be a formalization and an empowerment. We've already sort of talked about them indirectly. You did, Ron. So, uh, 
I, I remember it. I just okay. again, you I have to refer to my notes a lot of times. Right now, I'm not. I don't have my notes. Yeah, but you you mentioned this already. You mentioned the studies that we did. So March seventh, twenty twenty one. Um. Oh, oh, okay. That was the um, uh, understand or uh, the foundation, right? We we're studying the foundation. And then the uh no nope, nope, not quite. So so there is the foundation one, but that's earlier. That's gonna be in 2020 after July 18th. But March 7th is that is understanding the lines. Right. That's okay. this study, right? And December 26, 2021. What study? Oh, pardon me. Am I doing this right? Yeah. So that was that was when um uh, we had <laughs> I'm doing this backwards. So I'm doing the this. End of the oh. seven, seven, seven. Okay. So yeah. So March. So, yeah. I'm getting getting this wrong. So December 26, 2021 is the understanding of the lines. So was what was March 7th, 2021? Anybody? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Anybody remember? What what that's referring to? That's three twenty seven, right? Um, March twenty seven. Yeah, March twenty seven. That's how I'm trying to remember these things. Is I'm trying to draw these numbers up in my head, and it's it's hard to do. But now that I don't have my notes, March, I see yeah, it harder. March seven, March seven, twenty twenty one. That that's that's the yeah I was right that's the start of examining the foundation March seventh twenty twenty one and there's also a Sunday law presentation so so it is examining the foundation begins on March seventh so I'm wrong because uh, we did some other studies before that we did the twenty five twenty study and the seven weeks and so so I was right the first time but I was wrong in being right. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, um, makes perfect okay. sense. So this is examining the foundation, and this is understanding the lines. So, so we say these are the fleece. That's how we we lined it up with the fleece, fleece one and fleece two. So, so what is the fleece about? Why, why would we put these as the formalization and the empowerment of the message? Well, that was, uh, wasn't that Gideon's test for God? Okay, so it's Gideon's test. So we're, in a sense, testing God, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, and Aran, what are you saying about the Sunday Law presentation on March 7th, 2021? That's just dealing with that it symbolizes the Sunday Law? Right? That's what you're saying? I just remember you had a couple of presentations March 7th. Right. So, so we know March 7th, uh, 321, right? That's the Sunday law. And I Constant. thought you had some kind of time span connected to it as well. Yeah. Now, I believe I did that in 2022, but... No, I could be wrong. It could have been 2021. So, so anyway, I know that I understood this uh, March 7th, 21, because um, that's going to be 1,700 years, right, from Constantine's Sunday Law. So I know I did something with that. But whether that was in our examining the foundation study or not, I don't know. But... But that's when we started examining the foundation. So and I think we did the study on Ezekiel prior to that. I think the study on Ezekiel ended. Because um, we did uh, 105 studies on Ezekiel. So, um, But yeah, so this is a symbol of the Sunday law. Now, uh, the formalization of the message is the Sunday law in 
Millerite history, it's July 21st, 2021. It's the formalization of the message. And when you put it in a line, it represents the Sunday law. But um, that's a whole other study. So we got these two fleece. Now, how are these fleece? The examining the foundation and the understanding the lines. Because what is the fleece addressing? Um, to see whether or not God was, or uh, that it was actually God talking to him. Okay, so the dew, what is the dew and what is the wool? And what is the ground? I can't remember. Okay, the so we know the, would, the dew would be water, right? Yeah, but it's going to represent the Holy Spirit, would it not? Right. I would think. And and a message. So these messages, the first one, the wool is wet and the ground is dry. The next one, the ground is dry or, or the ground is wet, the wool is dry. Right. So the wool is wet the first time, dry the next and reverse with the ground. So. So what's the difference then between these two? Why would one represent the fleece being wet and the ground dry and the other the fleece being dry and the ground wet? Uh, well, one other than the request. Okay, but yeah, like symbols, what are the symbols of of this? If this is the Holy Spirit. One class of worshippers receive the Holy Spirit, and the other class do not. Okay, so it's the two classes of worshippers, right? Now, the midnight cry, we know in Millerite history, the formalization of the message is the midnight cry at Boston. The empowerment of that message is the midnight cry at Exeter. They're both the midnight cry. One occurs at midnight, one occurs later but they're really the same way mark in a sense, right? They're doubling of that way mark because midnight is a doubling. And so these two classes of worshipers are distinguished by these messages. So when we get to January 11th to 12th, 2023, I mean, we, we are placing this as the arrival of the third angel's message, but we know that this is actually going to be a period of time in this movement. So we don't just get to that date and the third angel arrives and people make their decisions. Oops, just gotta put a three there. But these are the messages that are going to separate these two classes of worshipers, correct? Yeah, it sounds familiar. So, so that's why, you know, we put him as the formalization and the empowerment. In a sense, they're one way, Mark. They're midnight, midnight cry. And then we have this message that arrives January 11th to 12th, 2023. Now, that message uh, that we get in connection with January 11th, 12th to 12th, 2023, what is it? Repeat that question, please. So what is it that arrived on January 11th to 12th, 2023? Uh, that was uh, that was the failed prediction of, of Collins. Okay, so how does that relate, though, to the arrival of the third message? Not sure how you're seeing that. Okay, Iran, what what was connected with that date? Do you remember? Which date again? Well, January eleventh. So there's a couple of things. Okay, so. It's a symbol of the Sunday law, right? So the third angel arriving, October 22. But but we have 
in our studies, it's going to be study number 267, right? Which yeah, is I can remember that. Okay. And as far as understanding what light comes to us then, what would be the light that came to us in connection with this? Not necessarily on that date specifically, but. Are we talking about the, the January 11th date still? Yeah. So, so what is that date? What, what's, what's occurring in connection with the lines as we understand them? with January 11th, the end of January 11th, beginning of January 12th. Um, is the end of a structure that was created by Collins chronology. So it's the end of the structure, but we are saying that a third angel's message arrives then. So what would be that message? And how would we look at it in this because here we didn't actually put a verse there for January 11th to 12th, 2023, when we drew this out. Because we have the sign of the fleece, right, in Judges 6. For God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on the ground. That ends Judges chapter 6. And then we're going to say that Judges chapter uh, 6 verse 33 to 35 is going to start the next line, right? So there's this call that's there. So obviously, this January 11th to 12th, 2023 has to be represented in the story of Gideon, but it would have to be represented in chapter 7. Well, I know we did the reconciliation prior to that. Uh, that was December 26th. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we already began to 2020. Yeah. So so we already began to, to to seek to reconcile. I seem to recall something, but I can't can't put my finger on it. Now we know that that what's gonna happen is Gideon's 300 man. That's gonna be the next line. Um so is it this call that this um, this separation is this the arrival of the third angels is this related to actually judges chapter seven that is is the line below judges seven is that a zoom into the arrival of the third angel in the line above of chapter six I wasn't, we weren't so sure about that. Didn't we start to apply that to um, uh, like going back to and starting over again? Not, not, you know, like the, right. So it's, it's a repeat and enlarge. That, that was it. Repeat and but, enlarge. But that's what I would say is that, that if oh. we're going to put it in this simple way, we know that when we zoom into a way mark, um, that we can then create a line. And I'm saying that this, this way mark here that's marked by January 11th to 12th, 2023, the end of Collins' line, this is the way mark written out. So Judges 7 is a zoom into that one, that way mark. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what we were getting at, yeah. But it's going to reach back. So just because it's a zoom into that way mark, it's actually going to reach back all the way to September 7th, 2019. Right? So because we know that when you zoom into a way mark, it, often it's the events prior to that that are going to give you this information. So 
This is going to address, now notice this line goes up to January 11th to 12th, 2023. So, so, but this is a zoom in more particularly to the third angel's message aspect, which has to do with this separation of these two classes that happens with the end of our line, right, moving onward. So it's still going to just bring us up to there. Each one of these lines is going to bring us up to here. Now, I would say that this line here, Judges chapter 8, is actually a zoom into this way mark on this line. December 25th, 2021. So, so this line is this line of Gideon from chapter six. Chapter seven is a zoom into this way mark, the, th the arrival of the third angel. It gives us more information about what that message is, right? What, what happens when the third angel arrives? And then this line here, which is the 20th day of the ninth month, December 25th, 2021. This line here is zooming into this way mark on this line, which is a zoom into the way mark on this line. So these are actually, each time we go from six to seven to eight, we're, we're seeing a fractalization. We're zooming into a way mark and to a line uh, that's below the one above. Does that make sense? A lot better sense than what I've had. Okay. But we'll see that they, they contain a lot of the same information, and that's understandable because we saw that in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So a way mark on one line can have a different purpose on another line. But the fact that each three of these way marks, or each three of these lines, end with the same way mark, is because this is all about the same message. But these lines are, are giving us more detail about that. They have that connection. Yeah. And, and we can see that, um, you know, here, these, these lines, in a sense, are almost the same. They both have November 9th here. But this November 9th is actually a formalization of the message in this line below in Judges 7 where the arrival of the message is September 7th, 2019. So, so what we still haven't done with this line, which we're gonna have to do once we get here on Sunday, um, come back to this, is to recognize particularly what these lines are illustrating, what light they're illustrating, what the periods of darkness are and why they're structured in this way. What it is that we are to come to understand from the line of Gideon, because the line of Gideon is going to be um, the uh, empowerment of the first message in the judge's line. Right. And then when we got through these other way marks, which we're going to get go through again and draw the lines for each of these, we're going to start to see a really comprehensive picture of the history of this movement and particularly what's happening right now and our present responsibility uh, to this message and to each other. That makes sense. Yes, sir. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, we're gonna close with prayer and uh, you can join me in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we, we struggle with understanding, but we know that you are helping us to see things more clearly as we look at these lines, uh, but it keeps um, hitting closer to home. We can see that what you are asking of us is not something that is pleasant. Um, it is a cross that we have to bear. And we know, Lord, that uh, 
We need to hear your voice. We need to see our, our sins. We need to be able to confess them, to repent. We need to be reconciled to you and to those around us, to those that have hurt us. And we have to trust, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can do a work that we can't. Be with each person um, today. We pray for comfort for those that are grieving, for healing for those that are sick. And um, we pray, Lord, that our sins can be forgiven, that we can experience the joy of your salvation. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.